Hello there, fellow paladins of the Republic, and welcome back to some Battletech lore. Today we shall cover some battle armor types out of the last major designer faction which we haven't covered yet, the Republic of the Sphere. I'm also aware that I haven't yet made a video on the Republic of the Sphere itself. On the bright side, I have no idea when this video is actually coming out, so maybe by that point I will have already covered the Republic of the Sphere or at least made an overview of it. Regardless, the designs of today are the Angerona, the Centaur and the Simeon. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? The first of today's designs is the Angerona, massing at one ton. I do apologize if it's actually the Angerona, but I do get a Spanish-esque vibe out of it, so I'm gonna call it the Angerona. Based on the lessons learned from the Coalition campaign, the New Republic Armed Forces needed an infantry scout battlesuit that was both mobile and stealthy. Starcore, still enjoying success with their first entry into the battle armor market, the Copis, was invited to expand their small Terran facility and create just such a design. Although only in production for two years, the Angerona had still managed to become a well-known and popular suit. Even before full production, it made a name for itself with the eight Hastati Sentinels. On the world of Shipka, heavily armed militants, believed to be Capellan-backed, were threatening to destabilize the planet's Foxborough continent. Not wanting to put Shipka's Republic militia, who were still mostly ex-Capellan citizens, to the test, the 8 Hastati was sent instead to deal with the enemy. Two squads of Hastati battle armor, one a purifier squad and the other Angerona suits undergoing a field trial, were doing recon on a small town believed to be hiding a large concentration of rebels. Penetrating the perimeter, the Hastati troopers discovered the rogue militants and were preparing to withdraw when the purifier suits were wiped out in a rapid fusillade out of two wings of Ying Long battle armor. Watching their fellows being gunned down, the Angerona squad quickly retook the initiative and began stalking the Capellan suits. Able to move almost undetected, the Angeronas would use their stealthy mobility and patience and wait for the Capellan suits to move and thereby reveal themselves. After about one hour of cat and mouse, only three of the Yin Longs managed to run away from the city. Deployment remained limited to active line units, primarily the Hastati Sentinels, the Stone's Lament and the Liberator's units. The Office of the Quartermaster has begun accepting requisition from other units, but there is no specific timetable for those requests to be filled. Borrowing concepts out of, ironically, the Capellan's Trinity battle armor, the Angerona does not have any jump jets but instead it was designed to travel at more than 30 km an hour on the ground. The lack of jump jets was done on purpose, despite the loss of tactical mobility as those would be counter to the suit's main mission, to move over land and operate with maximum stealth in open or city terrain. Likewise, the Angerona's design team steered away from mimetic armor. While that technology is now well understood, the purifier suits make up a good portion of the RAF's battle arm forces. The armor's inability to mask a moving unit kept it from being used optimally. Instead, the Angerona combines improved stealth armor with a full camouflage system, allowing the suit to be almost invisible to many sensors. Despite being rated as a medium-class suit, the overall armor protection is more in keeping with its main mission as a scout. A light recoilless rifle provides the suit's primary offensive weaponry. This is comparable to the mag shot in damage, the loss of range a necessary trade-off for a suit already in risk of having no room left for the operator. Backup firepower is provided by an AP weapon mount affixed under the left arm, providing anti-infantry or mission-specific weaponry. Basic manipulators allow the Angerona to ride battle mechs and vehicles. However, for added stability, the weapon casing wraps around the right-hand manipulator. This requires the rifle to be unlimbered if the Angerona is to best ride to the exterior of another unit. The specialist Recon Angerona was introduced in 3085. 
The suit retains its camo system, but drops the other weapons for improved sensors, remote sensor dispenser, and a light machine gun fitted to the left arm as the only mounted weapon. The suit was also given armored gloves in place of the standard manipulators. This allows the trooper to carry regular infantry weapons in its hands. Finally, the Aegis Point defense suit, Angerona, was introduced in 3132 as a testbed for the Risk Advance Point defense system for use on battle armor. The Aegis is frequently used to thicken the anti-missile defenses of the Ares Super Battle Mech. Ground speed and armor protection remains the same as the basic Angerona, but the camo system was removed to make room for the APDS. The Aegis suit retains the anti-personnel weapon mount as the only offensive option. The second of today's designs is the Simeon, again massing at one ton. For much of her career, one paladin, Kara Rutherford, objected harshly to the cost of battle armor in general. In her view, highly advanced and specialist battlesuits made it difficult to deploy them in large numbers and keep them operational in the battlefield. A design study commissioned by her resulted in the initial concept for the Simeon. But ironically, it was only after her death that production began. Rhodes Foundry produced a design that could deploy in the field for extended times and with minimal logistical support. Agile and maneuverable, the Simeon relies on its modular weapon mount to project damage. The Simeons often deploy less sophisticated weapons unless they have scavenged a cache of weapons in the field. While the armor protection is lacking, its magnetic claws make it exceptional at swarming attacks, and good commanders rarely permit the Simeon to engage in a protracted range battle. It would become an important part of Levin's efforts to destabilize the Republic's enemies outside the fortress. It would be unknown to the Republic's enemies, and simple enough that it could be manufactured by almost anyone in the inner sphere. Its nature also allowed more of them to be built in the months leading up to April 3136. Substantial numbers of the Simeons fought in every realm bordering the Republic of the Sphere, engaged in many false flag operations. On Lyon, Simeons were used to suppress a supposedly Republic loyal militia that was actually part of a separatist faction. The militia booked some successes against the RAF, but they would fail to notice the trackers among some of the suits they destroyed. During campaigns in the Draconis March, an RAF unit masquerading as part of the Davion 1st Seti Hussars Beta Command made extensive use of the Simeon. In one particular engagement, a lance of gunsmiths rushed the command lance of the 3rd Diron Regulars distracting the bodyguard of the commander while hovercraft delivered nearly two platoons of simians. The Taisa was unable to disengage from the battle armor, which quickly brought his own Tenshi down. The force commander cracked the cockpit and delivered a message which would cause Taisa Morrison to call off his attack, and then commit seppuku the same night. The 3144 combat on Galatea had added accolades to the simians' combat record where disguised RAF units masquerading as mercenaries would use small craft to drop platoons on top of the Jade Falcon formations. The targets were mechs and vehicles used in support of the Elemental Stars after the clan battle armor had been deployed to their objectives. While these tactics incurred heavy losses on the RAF troops, they would force the Falcons to abandon or recall their Elementals to fight off the swarming Simeons. The main hallmark of the Simeon is its mobility, being able to outpace typical battle armor while retaining high jump jet capacity. Its 350 kilos worth of armor, while not able to stop heavy weapons, can allow a soldier to survive long enough to close with the target using its mobility. It sports a modular weapon mount on the right shoulder. This system usually holds a small laser, but other configurations include a light recoilless rifle, a flamer, or heavy machine guns. Its arms are also used as effective melee weapons when engaging infantry, with magnetic claws enabling them to do additional damage to vehicles and battle mechs. The third and final design of today is the Centaur, massing a bit more at 1.5 tons. Conceived at the same time as the Simeon, this one has no progenitor though. 
Its main purpose was to provide highly mobile artillery support, relying on support from any available war machines to maintain contact with the enemy. It was also built by Rhodes Foundry, the initial deployment mirroring that of the Simeons too. Advanced metallurgy was used to create the ultra-lightweight barrels of the battlesuit artillery weapon, making it light enough for deployment. The ammunition uses a special kilafrit propellant and a hydraulic ram to initiate deflagration. Recoil compensation is almost non-existent, and the legs of the suit are mechanically locked prior to firing to prevent stress on the operator. The static fold-out legs do not permit a properly actuated firing platform though, resulting in a very high ballistic arc and a short effective range. The engineers at Rhodes wisely used reactive armor on the Centaur, drastically reducing the consequence of misfires and permitting the suits to survive some minor counter-battery fire. Magnetic clamps were included instead of a modular mount to make the Centaur able to support formations that lacked dedicated battle armor transport. While the tube artillery unit could be detached to grant the Centaur improved ground speed, this capability is barely ever used in the field. That is because of the reluctance the operators have to relinquish the only weapon that makes them effective. Most Centaur deployments occurred in support of the Simeon or other battle armors utilized by the RAF. In that capacity, the Centaur was efficient at destroying hostile infantry formations, particularly battle armor and dug-in troops. The suit lacks the ammunition to maintain a sustained bombardment, but a common tactic that emerged on Carnaf has the available Centaurs deploy in two separate groups which would support each other. The resilience against their own shells allows the suits to scratch their own backs when in close contact with enemy infantry. When the Jade Falcons attempted to absorb the world of Suck 2, subsequent to the Clan Wolf migration, they found the Ghost Bears in opposition. After a week of maneuvering and small-scale trials, the Jade Falcons led a running battle through the planet's northern polar continent. When the Bear Trinary entered the valley, a nearby squad of hidden RAF Centaurs would fire from an ancient Hansen's Rough Riders firebase at a ridge, causing an avalanche. The Ghost Bear mechs that survived would be shelled by the Centaurs, as were the Jade Falcons mechs, the moment they came out of the snow. While the angry Ghost Bears fought hard with their remaining troops and mechs, the imbalance caused by the ambush would be insurmountable, and soon they would be ejected. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about these Republic of the Sphere designs, the Centaur, Simeon, and Angerona for today. These are not the only RAF designs though, so I'll definitely return with a part 2 to this video, with even more Republic battle armor. However, for today, which one of these did you like the most? Which one did you find the most useful? Did you ever use any of these in your games or collections? As always, I look forward to reading your thoughts and experiences in the comments below. If you found the episode informative or entertaining, do leave a like, share or subscribe for future content. Thanks a lot for watching and have an awesome and healthy day. This is GDN signing out.